Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Vicky Price, I'm Chief Economic Advisor at the Centre for Economics and Business Research in the UK, and I'd like to welcome you to today's RSA online event. And I'm delighted to have the chance to talk today to Linda Scott, who is in the US right now. And Linda is an Emeritus Professor of Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the University of Oxford, Senior Consulting Fellow at Chatham House, and she's the Founder and Senior Advisor of the Global Business Coalition for Women's Economic Empowerment. She also founded the Power Shift Forum for Women in the World Economy, as well as Double X Economy LLC, which is a consulting firm specializing in women's economic empowerment. I have to say that her new book, Double X Economy, is a fascinating and wide-ranging study of the incredible potential that liberating and empowering women can have to improve all our lives, strengthen our economies, and better our societies. And I have to say that I enjoyed it hugely and wish I had read it before I wrote my own book, Women vs. Capitalism, since it's given me so much more that I could have thought about than I thought at the time when I was writing mine back in the autumn of 2019. So Linda, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, is it possible for you to just uh, give us a few comments on the book itself and summarize the issues that got you to write it and and perhaps as pointers to what the sort of role theme is. Yeah. Well, the, the idea of the double X economy um, is that it's the collective economy formed by women. It's very analogous to the underground economy or the informal economy or the gig economy. Uh, what characterizes it most perhaps is that it has um, a very distinctive pattern of inequality in every nation on earth and that it is also held by constraints that are or have been in place in all over the world. Um, and so as a result, you can uh, analyze it sort of collectively and, and gain some insights um, to things about it that are important important in the book. One is, is the potential for growth and prosperity and all kinds of good things, uh, transparency, innovation, that can come out of uh, lifting the constraints on the double X economy, but also the humanitarian benefits, which often um, currently incur a lot of cost. So it's a call to action, really. It really is a recruiting book, um, trying to get people to know this and understand it and be ready to take action. When you talk about obstacles, can you go into that in a little bit more detail? Because obviously those obstacles must differ depending on which part of the world you look at. Yes, I think one thing that is, um, that is a very illustrative and important um, obstacle, which is actually, if you take a maybe, you know, a, a little bit historical perspective, is the same around the world, um, is um, if you take a look at the um, land ownership data that's put mm -hmm. out by the Food and Agriculture Organization, what you find is that on average, women own about 19% of the land in the world, and men own upwards of 80% of it. And this is true pretty much in every country. There are a few outliers. Britain is a little bit worse than the global average. Um, and when I looked at this, I said, well, this is a non-random pattern. Um, why did this happen? And what you see is that over time, all around the world, women have actually been forbidden. Uh, every case that I looked at, okay, I'm sure there are some exceptions somewhere, but have been forbidden usually by law from earning from owning land and that this rolls up into over time because it was the main store of wealth throughout history rolls up into men controlling capital in the world today and that of course has huge follow-on effects so i presume the theme must be that economic empowerment is crucial in terms of getting gender equality Yes, absolutely, it, it, it is. And it is also crucial in terms of getting the benefits that can be had from it. You, and you have to look at it from a gender lens. You can't just have interventions that are equal or gender neutral. You have to be paying attention. And some of the examples, for example, um, with the land um, ownership in particular, uh, the United Nations uh, estimates that um, if we level the playing field for women and men, uh, in that area of the economy, not only would uh, agricultural economies get significant growth from it, but we could feed 150 million of the world's chronically hungry. So it's, it's a big deal, yeah. 
Did you find huge differences between regions or countries that struck you? And therefore, what can one learn from those that have done it maybe slightly better than others? Um, yes, I found differences. Uh, there are differences, I argue, of degree and not in substance. Um, and what I ended up concluding was that it had more to do with where that society was in time than it did with differences such as religion or even industrialization, perhaps. Um, a good example is that, um, is that the Middle East, for example, has a lot of restrictions on women that most people chalk up to Islam. But in fact, the restrictions are much, much older than Islam. And, um, and so, and if you go around the world, what you see is that those restrictions were in place at that same time around the world. The, the difference is that in one part of the world, they started changing those things, and in another part of the world, they didn't. And the way that they changed them, I mean, I presume they have to overcome cultures. I mean, you talk really, and what you're implying is that there's, a, there's an ingrained culture in some societies they can't get rid of, just, you know, irrespective of religion. And that takes quite some time. Do you find that, as I did when I looked at it, that the role of the state is very important in this, in terms of legislating some of those controls away that forbid women from working or make it more difficult, or, or also legislating to eliminate discrimination? Do you, do you think that, that matters? Do you think that the, that the only way forward is through stricter government intervention, or does one have to just wait for those societies to just evolve, which might take forever? Yeah, no, I agree with you. It's going to require government intervention. There's no question about it. But I also think that we have to be mindful that legislation only goes so far. And it's not just that, um, you know, cultures are different, which actually I, I don't like as an argument, even though I'm re referring to religion and things like that. Um, but also that, that um, frankly, that the men's response um, is often to stonewall, and we, I think we need to come to grips with that, um, and that uh, family influences are often sort of retrograde. And so those things happen behind the scenes of legislation a lot of the time. So I think to be more realistic, we have to think more, much more broadly. But when you look at the developed world, um, it is legislation that's helped hugely. So non-discrimination legislation, for example, in places like the States, even though you know, we're still lagging behind in terms of pay gaps and so on. Uh, so you got opportunity acts and, and so on that we've seen all, all across the, the Western world. Uh, they haven't had quite the impact we'd want them to. In other words, we still don't have gender equality anywhere. Um, but nevertheless, they've been important. You, you're not saying that those are not significant as such. Right. No, definitely not. Uh, and, and it wouldn't fit with the data if I did. Um, and it also wouldn't fit with my own practice if I said that, because a lot of what goes on in women's economic empowerment is actually trying to replicate some of what went right in those nations. Uh, the main one being trying to include women better in the labor force, the formal labor force. Uh, this you know, really has an enormous effect, not only for the nations, but for the women's autonomy. Um, so I think that's right. I do think one of the things to bear in mind, and I know people sort of say that, but it is really true, that it is possible to backslide. And it has happened mm -hmm. in history that there have been temporary moments, such as in the Ottoman Empire, where women had improved economic freedom, and then it got taken back by some, you know, conservative intervention. Well, indeed. And uh, there is a concern right now that we may be going backwards because of coronavirus and the impact that it has had by making us women stay at home or sort of making people go back to the types of cultures they had before. Are you uh, worried? Are you looking at this now? I mean, there has been some progress, without doubt, in, in large parts of the world. It's uh, slow in some areas, but certainly, in, again, in Western societies, it's been slightly faster than elsewhere. Uh, do you think that there are dangers ahead uh, because of crisis that we revert back to norms and stereotypes that uh, we've been trying to get away from for some time? Yes, I think I am worried and, and many, as I'm sure you know, of the international organizations like the United Nations and World Economic Forum are putting out warnings saying the women are going to lose 50 years of progress here if we don't do something about this. And I think most of it, in my opinion, most of it comes not from industrial clusters, which a lot of people are pointing to, but from this issue of pulling childcare out from underworking women. And I think it shows conclusively that economists who say, oh, well, 
you know, or, you know, management people who say, oh, well, women make this choice to go home, and so it's their choice, so it doesn't matter, you know, um, is that it isn't a choice in this case. And um, it's really um, sort of involuntary, uh, going, this going back home. And I think it illustrates that, and also that we can no longer treat women as a frivolous part of the economy. We're essential, and um, you can't, you know, you need to look at childcare as infrastructure, basically. Indeed. I mean, there are quite a lot of people who think that childcare should be free. And in fact, it's practically free from a very young age in the Nordic societies, in other words, in Northern Europe, uh, like in Scandinavian countries, where indeed gender equality seems to be slightly more advanced than anywhere else. So it has been recommended in quite a lot of places. And, and it seems to uh, lead to quite an improvement in um, labor force participation, then seniority. So, so is, are you suggesting that as well in terms of you know free child care for everyone, or, or yeah. are you more careful in that? Yeah. Yes, I think that um, people make a lot of noise about maternity leave, but really the only provision of that sort for for women for mothers that works that is known to work is the affordable child care, high quality, low you know costs, um, universal child care. And this is all we know that works. And it works quite well. Um, I think one of the things that worries me about it is people don't want to do that because I think this, a, lot of, a lot of the world leaders still think of it as a frivolous thing that we give to women who should be at home anyway, right? <laughs> and, and don't really come to grips with the circumstances in the here and now. Um, some people want to do a child care credit, which to me is like handing somebody half a bus ticket and telling them they need to build their own public transport system. I mean, that's just absurd. And some people only want it to um, uh, go to low-income families. And I think that's only going to contribute to greater inequality. So I would really prefer to see it as a something akin to the roads. That's very interesting because it's the same um, arguments that are going on right now about uh, what is now called universal basic income. So this idea that everyone receives a certain amount and uh, they can do what they like with it, but at least it gives them some sort of independence and guarantee that they're not going to fall into poverty. Of course, women, as we know, are much more likely to fall into poverty than men because they generally don't earn very much. They work in uncertain environments uh, and they're the first to lose their jobs, as we've been discussing also with COVID right now. Um, and there are lots of suggestions that you know, it should actually not be universal, but should be uh, means tested. The moment you start doing that, you kill the idea of, uh, you know, how it can work. And, and you, you make it so conditional that in the end, a little bit like what you're saying, uh, it just loses the purpose that it has. But for women, it must be still very important to be receiving something, given that so many women do work which is unpaid at present and which is not valued at all in the community. And it doesn't get calculated in GDP, in the output of the economy. So are you in favor at all of the UBI of that sort, um, universal basic income? Um, I am, in general, in favor of universal basic income. I am also, in particular, in favor of it for stay-at-home mothers. Um, I think that they do a particularly good you know, service for national economies by cultivating children and, and that they deserve as a result and that society owes them uh, some kind of support. I think the other reason that it's particularly important for women, is, and I do talk a, a good bit about this in the book, is that women take on a personal economic risk when they stay at home that follows them for the rest of their lives, as you mentioned, the poverty, for example. And, um, and I think that they, they need to have something that mitigates that, that risk. I think the other thing is that it, this is the thing that leads us back to previous times. It renders them dependent. And when you do that, it causes all kinds of other vulnerabilities that are very negative. So, yeah, I think, yeah, the long answer is yes. <laughs> well, the other risk they're taking, of course, is a very economic one in the sense that they're not going to be earning what they would have earned otherwise. They're going to a trajectory of uh, earnings over their lives, which is considerably lower than would have been the case otherwise. And also, of course, they've spent money educating themselves, or someone spent money educating them. And in many places, you had to pay quite a lot of money to be educated at a tertiary level. And of course, you, you, the loss you have, the opportunity cost is enormous, and the investment is lost. So there's an extra reason, at least that, that's what I, I, I was looking at, the economics of it, and I clearly decided that it makes absolutely no sense. It's almost not worth for the women who end up uh, at home after this going and getting properly educated. So there is a need to 
to compensate them for that for a bit, I'm guessing. And, uh, and then, of course, encourage them to go back to work and, and, in fact, get a return for their investment. Do you look at it that way? Absolutely. Yeah, yes. In fact, I think I say the exact same thing that you're saying in terms of the education is that we put a lot of money into educating women and actually they outperform men. And there are, for example, I think 30% more women in university now in Britain than there are men. Uh, and then we throw them under the bus. And that is bad for them because they lose their investment. But a lot of the government and the social investment, you know, charitable and that sort of thing goes into educating them too. And that's lost. And it's a terrible inefficiency and it's just a tragic waste of human potential. Absolutely. With, regard to, yeah, with regard to the question of whether or not um, mm. they're just going to stay at home and we should, I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't think that, um, at least the women that I know of who have invested in their education want to use it and um, want to achieve. And I think there are other reasons that people work besides just paying the rent. I mean, they have to pay the rent, right? But there are other reasons, and I don't think we should discount those. No, no, absolutely. And I think all the evidence suggests that women are just as ambitious and want to make something of their, of their education as, as the men, and then they get frustrated. So can we talk about that frustration? Because you have quite a lot in the book about the way that women are treated or perceived. Quite a nice section on entrepreneurs and how women entrepreneurs are often ignored, uh, or at least they're not taken seriously in what they say. Can you elaborate on that? Because obviously that's another obstacle for their advancement. Yes, yes. I, it's unbelievable to me um, that I think in Britain they get 9% of all available investment money. I mean, there's just no excuse for that. But I think that, that this is, again, one of those things that comes out of the control of capital. To the extent that the men control vastly, you know, more capital, it means, first of all, that they have in the past at least owned the businesses that women are employed by, and they also are, are controlling investment. Uh, money and uh, I think I give an example in there about things like the venture capital versus the angel capital. Mm -hmm. You see, yeah, some difference there. Um, but the the other thing is that the financial sector is so overwhelmingly dominated by males and has always been um, that. Yeah, I think it's really toxic. And uh, that, can, I'm yeah. so sorry. Yes, uh, did, uh, how can you change that? I mean, the the interesting thing is not just do they dominated the men uh, in terms of the ownership of it, if you like, or the running of organizations, but um, they also perceive anyone who comes in from the outside perhaps is equally, uh, you know, um, competent uh, uh, with ideas, but happens to be a woman, uh, not as seriously as they would have done if the same person, if, sorry, they said the same thing, but it was actually a man who was saying it. So, you have some examples of that. Can you, can you explain right. why this happens? Yeah, right. So, for example, venture capital. This is The venture capitalists have been studied, I think, the most uh, in terms of the way they treat and perceive um, the various people who pitch to them. And it's just been shown over and over again that they will look at the same person in the same pitch and they will think the man is great and they think the woman is not. And it has been done demonstrated so many times that you got to wonder, I wonder, how these guys keep going, you know? I mean, why they don't feel compelled to change. It's quite unflattering, I think, um, but they don't care. And some of that, I think, is because in that very masculinist kind of culture, that attitude toward women kind of feeds on itself and grows. And this is another thing that I've talked about in the book as well. It's the group dynamic. And is it only that, or is it also a certain laziness of anyone from outside? And that's what also affects diversity. We're in the middle of, of uh, the whole diversity issue being a very hot topic. Um, is it that uh, decisions are made in a, as I said before, lazy way? You just hire someone who's more like you, or you talk to somebody who's more like you, and you therefore think they'll think like you. Uh, you don't want to take risks. Do you think there's an element of that? Yes, I do. And I, I recently saw a study that illustrates that really well, um, that it was um, funding or, or, yeah, funding in um, incubators. And that this, um, you know, of course, there's this big skew in who, who works in incubators and accelerators. And uh, what, they, what this group found was that it was all about the method that they had, that the 
people who ran it had of, of recruiting people in is that they basically recruited in people they already knew mm-hmm. and said and said this is our only way of knowing that the person is high quality which i mean we know from a million studies is absolutely the opposite of the truth and um but i think a lot of it i think honestly a lot of it is they're just too lazy to run a proper search yeah i think so too so it's a combination of that and a combination of some sort of bias that is exists but I think what I think was quite interesting you have um, uh, quite a lot in the book about academic economists and of course being an economist myself I'm, I was very interested in that and we do see that this is one profession where women do probably worse than they do in many others uh, very few women professors in economics and they sort of disappear as you go up the, the scale very quickly in terms of seniority uh, and this seems to be you know, quite a prejudice. It's true that women, when they look, or girls, when they grow up and they look at economics, it tends to be, you know, the image they have in their minds, something like, you know, a man in the city with loads of pound notes or, or dollars or whatever you are, um, falling, you know, from the sky, if you like. Uh, it's a very masculine area, uh, which perhaps puts women off and they, they don't do economics uh, at the sort of, rate that men do but once they're into the academic profession itself of economics then they face even more prejudice it seems than is the case in many other areas of study can you elaborate a little bit on this i think it's absolutely what you're saying is true and and yes as you, as you said i have i have a, a section documenting that and also a few anecdotes of my own experience and um yeah it's amazing um and i think honestly again it some of it has to do with the proportion it's so male dominated and that i think one of the uh, female economists have commented that i quote in the book that a lot of it is because they think that their prestige is going to be lost if they have women and so they take they take action to bully them out and this is another thing where i think we spend so much time trying to find out what is wrong with the women so that they don't go into economics or don't go into finance or don't go into tech and won't look at the plenty of, of evidence that the men are trying to keep them out. They just are. And so we're never going to solve that problem if we don't. But, but why are there more than in other professions? If you look even in the scientific community, women don't do that badly. It seems to be something about economics. Is it because... It's not as clear cut. It's not sort of if A, then definitely B. Is it because it leaves itself open to all sorts of interpretations and therefore, you know, you can find fault in things much more easily? Is that what you think the root of it is? Yeah, I think that the same kind of thing probably applies to economics as applies in other areas and certainly applies in business schools where I was. And that is, you know, you see the same Vita on a man, and the, and right? Is that they attribute more more uh, quality to the man uh, if it's the same. And they do also, and I talk about this in the book, they, they will say that this woman did this very fine article, but she probably had some man do her math, okay, or something like that, right? And so they will say anything to sort of right the balance with their prejudices. And I think they do that. And, and once again, I do think a lot of it Unfortunately, the cause, um, or at least what I argue in the book is the cause, is that male dominance itself perpetuates male dominance. And that the only way that's been shown that I know of is to break the uh, ratio. Um, And that's, I think, has been demonstrated pretty many times. If you get to a certain ratio of women in an organization, in a department, or in a discipline, a lot of that goes away. Um, but it's catch-22, right? How do you do it? You know, because yes. women, especially now, women can go into other stuff. They don't have to put up with it. Yes, how do you do it? I mean, that, that's an interesting question. Do you enforce it? Well, this, is, this gets back to your contention that we, we started with, which I, well, I think is quite a good one, is that it's going to take some intervention. It's going to take intervention. That's all there is to it. And, you know, nobody wants to have that. But again back to, for example, the work I do in Africa and in uh, Asia that um, has kind of a movement behind it is predicated on the notion that the women won't change their situation unless you do something about the situation. And, um, and actually, they're so, in so many cases, so, so restricted and so downtrodden that it's unreasonable to expect them to change it themselves. 
So, yeah, I think you're right. It's going to take something like that. But uh, if we don't do something like that, this can take forever. I mean, the World Economic Forum calculates that we won't get gender equality for, what is it? It's either 100 or 200 years, I, I forget, which whatever it is, is too long. And as John Maynard Keynes said, as we all know, the famous economist, uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, in the long run, we're all dead. So we can't really wait for this. So right. a bit more enforcement? Uh, is that what you mean? I mean, are you optimistic at the end of the day that... that we can achieve something, yeah. maybe the women. Yeah. Actually, in spite of all this, I'm very optimistic and I'm hoping oh. it comes through in the book. I've been a little bit upset that some reviews have, have called it more angry, you know, and, and it certainly has righteous indignation, I'll admit to that. But it's meant to be a hopeful book because we now have so much data that we have a pretty good idea what we need to do. And we have a pretty good idea of what's going to work. Um, and so if we, if we will go ahead and admit to ourselves what some of the problems are and give ourselves the freedom to take these steps, we can fix this. We have that ability. Um, and it's just a matter of, you know, biting the bullet. I really hate those things where they say, oh, it's now going to take 200 years. It's now going to take 250 because even that suggests that there's a curve that is more or less continuous. And it's not. There's resistance and if you don't acknowledge that friction, if you will, you're not getting there. Okay, so we need to acknowledge the friction, and we will get there if we do acknowledge it, and everyone understands that we need to do something for the sake of the economy, for the sake of individuals, of course, and because such a waste of resource, I would guess, as well. But um, I think we've ended up more or less in an optimistic note. Um, if I'm not mistaken, so yeah, I think there's good reason to hope. And a lot of the international institutions are bought on to this. You know, that's never happened in history before. Yeah, it's good. Well, well, this is great. I think we could go on all day, but I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. So, Linda, thank you very much for taking the time to talk to me and giving such a fascinating overview of how we can unlock the incredible potential held by women across the world. And I'm very glad we didn't just talk about the UK and the US, but we actually looked across the world and uh, there's so much that can be unleashed uh, all around us if we do this right and if the governments perhaps intervene in the right way. Um, to those of you watching, I highly recommend Linda's book, The Double X Economy, makes a fantastically rigorous and passionate, as you can hear anyway, case for women's empowerment and gender equality and for very good reason too. In the meantime, do keep up with the RSA's channels for updates on further conversations and research insights and information also on how to get involved in the global network of fellows of the RSA. So, uh, for me, it's been a fantastic conversation. So, it's thank you delightful. again. Yeah. Thank you, Linda. Uh, and thank you all, of course, for watching too. Thank you very much.